Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Allen, and I'm the president of the Brookings Institution. And I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you all today to this panel discussion, which is part of a series of public events that we're holding under the Brookings Global Forum on Democracy and Technology. Now, technological change is a defining feature of our time. And we may be on the cusp of a significant deepening and acceleration of the ongoing digital transformation of our economies and societies as artificial intelligence spawns a new wave of innovations and COVID-19 pandemic gives added impetus to automation. Research and convenings under the Global Forum Project seek to promote ideas and policies and practices that could harness the new technologies in ways that support broad-based improvements in economic prosperity and strengthen our democratic societies. Now we're holding today's discussion in advance of the Leaders Summit on Democracy that the Biden administration will host on December 9th and 10th. I expect that the issues about technology, inequality, and democracy, and some of which we'll discuss on our panel today, will feature prominently in the summit's deliberations. My hope is that the work of our Brookings scholars and the external experts partnering with us in the Global Forum Project will make useful contributions to such important global and national debates. The new technologies hold great promise. They create new avenues and opportunities for a more prosperous future, but they also pose new challenges and risks. As the new technologies transform markets and nearly every aspect of business and work, they have highlighted and they have deepened economic and social fault lines across advanced and developing economies. One major fault line is economic inequality, which has been rising in many countries, including and significantly here in the United States. Technological change is an important part of the changing growth and distributional dynamics pushing inequality higher. Across economies, there is an uneven participation in the new opportunities created by digital transformation. Many are being left behind across industries and across the workforce and across different segments of our society. Rising inequality and related disparities and anxieties have been stoking social discontent and are a major driver of increased popular disaffection and political polarization that are so evident in today's world. And increasingly, unequal societies can weaken trust in public institutions and undermine democratic governance. It's also well known for its being a source of radicalizing populations. These mounting global disparities can imperil global stability. Against this background, an important research work stream in our Global Forums project focuses on technology's implications for inequality and on the policy agenda to promote more inclusive growth and development outcomes for the current and prospective advances in technology. Now, there are important questions that must be addressed. So in what ways are today's technological transformations contributing to higher inequality within economies? Should workers fear new automation? What are the implications of the new technologies for global inequality and economic convergence between economies? And what are the risks associated with rising inequality, including for the very concept of democratic governance? What new challenges arise from public policy and democratic societies to manage technological change, to build inclusive prosperity? And what new thinking and adaptations are needed to realign institutions and policies with the digital economy? Now we have today a very strong panel. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our panelists, David Autor, Kaushik Basu, and Heather Boucher, and Danny Roderick. They're all leading thinkers in their own fields. Uh, and thank you, all of you, for joining us today. I'm so deeply appreciative that you could be with us. And I am sure we're going to have a very stimulating discussion. So now I'll turn the floor over to Zia Qureshi, uh, who will moderate this important panel. Uh, thank you, John, uh, for your welcome and for uh, getting us off to an excellent start uh, with your uh, thoughtful opening remarks uh, that uh, set the context uh, and uh, frame our discussion today uh, very well. Uh, 
the technological change uh, led by digital technologies and the uh, now unfolding uh, innovations in artificial intelligence is indeed, uh, as uh, John just said, a defining feature of our time. Uh, the new technologies are reshaping economies and societies. And the already rapid uh, digital transformation is accelerating as a result of uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So the future is arriving faster than expected. And as John said, the new technologies hold great potential to boost economic prosperity and uh, human welfare. But they also pose important new challenges and risks not least uh, rising inequality uh, with its adverse economic, social, and political consequences. So how best to harness the potential of the new technologies while managing the challenges and risks is a key question of our time. And we are privileged to have an excellent panel today uh, to discuss important aspects of this question focusing on the uh, technology inequality nexus. Our panelists are all thought leaders on the issues at hand. Uh, they're all well recognized for their work and need little introduction. Uh, currently, David Orter is a Ford Foundation Professor of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Kaushik Basu is Professor of Economics and uh, C. Marks Professor of International Studies at Cornell University, and also uh, a non-resident senior fellow uh, in the Global Economy and Development Program here at uh, Brookings. Heather Boucher is member of the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House. And Denny Roderick is a Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. The event page at the Brookings website provides links to their very impressive resumes. So thank you, uh, Denny, David, Heather, and Kaushik for joining us today. And I would like to uh, thank also those who are tuning in uh, to this discussion. Uh, if you wish to uh, submit questions during the discussion, you can do so through the uh, Zoom uh, Q&A function. And thank you to those who have uh, submitted uh, questions uh, to the panel beforehand. So uh, we will proceed as follows. We will first have uh, three rounds of questions to the panelists uh, where panelists will be asked to share their thoughts on uh, first, uh, the links between uh, technological change and rising inequality. Uh, second, how public policy needs to respond. And third, uh, implications of uh, rising inequality uh, for uh, democratic governance. We will then turn to questions received uh, from, uh, from the viewers. Uh, so let me start with, uh, with uh, David Water. David, uh, you have been uh, at the leading edge of research uh, on how technology is uh, transforming markets, especially uh, labor markets, where there are a lot of uh, concerns and anxieties uh, about technology's impact on uh, the job and uh, wage prospects of uh, low to uh, middle skilled workers. So what does your research say about uh, why technological change, that is uh, automation, uh, digitalization, uh, has been pushing uh, inequality higher? And looking ahead, how might the technology inequality dynamics evolve in the next phase of digital transformation uh, led by artificial intelligence. Uh, there is concern that technology may continue to increase uh, inequality, even if new jobs and tasks emerge to replace those lost and prevent large scale, long-term uh, technological uh, unemployment. So should we worry more about inequality and less about uh, technological unemployment? David. 
Great, thank you. I, I have an hour to respond, right? Uh, just right. kidding. Um, okay, let me let me take those questions slightly out of order. So, you know, should we worry specifically about inequality uh, more than technological unemployment? I actually think we should worry most about the quality of jobs and the opportunities that they create. And I think the labor market is the sort of the foundation of a kind of a healthy economy and a healthy democracy and people's perception that they have uh, opportunity uh, stability and a you know a way to to uh, you know have a secure place in society through their work is the most foundational thing, much more than you know transfer programs and so on. And I'm sure Danny will have a lot more to say about this. Um, so uh, we should and so you know inequality and technological unemployment fall under that, but I think the foundation is really job quality. Let me answer a question about you know why has technology contributed to inequality and how this feeds into AI. So it's useful to think of sort of, you know, in very broad brushstrokes, you know, the era that we're in for the last four decades has been one of uh, computerization, digitization. And what computers do uh, is they carry out well-defined sets of rules that are, in, you know, encoded in symbolic processing and a procedure for, you know, calculating, uh, you know, a spreadsheet or sorting through information or searching data and so on. And so what computers have historically been applied to is carrying out what we would call routine codifiable tasks, tasks that follow a well-understood set of rules and procedures, whether that's office clerical work, whether that's production work, and so on. And, uh, and so you can sort of think of, you know, the, there's two things. There's a set of tasks that people need to do. Some of those tasks can be done by machines. The ones, the tasks that, are, that have been particularly suitable for computerization are the ones that we understand the rules. They don't require what we would call tacit knowledge, not like riding a bicycle or writing a persuasive essay where we don't know the rules, the things like how do you carry out a set of calculations. That has had the effect of displacing a lot of people from many middle skill activities in office, administrative, sales, production, and operative positions that carry out routine intensive work where they you know, execute well understood some rules and procedures. This has benefited people in professional and technical and managerial work for whom information and uh, processing and analysis are an input. Right. If you're a doctor, if you're a researcher, if you're a designer, all those, you know, that, those tools make you more productive. If you're a worker doing office clerical work, many people have been displaced. And the, end and the consequence is that many people who would have been doing middle skill work instead are doing services, food service, cleaning, security, entertainment, recreation, which are valuable things to do but they use relatively generic skill sets. They're not specialized. And so they tend not to pay well. In the United States, they tend to pay particularly poorly. So technology has contributed a lot to inequality through this hollowing out of the middle. Now, AI changes that because uh, in an interesting way, uh, as I said, there are sort of two pieces to this way of thinking about things. One is there's a set of tasks to accomplish and two is which ones could computers do? Well, the ones that carried out well understood rules. Well, AI removes that constraint. AI can learn to do things that we only tacitly understand because we give it examples and train it rather than write down those rules and procedures. And so it kind of opens the domain of what is feasible. So what does that imply? I, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna, and I'll just, I'm gonna, I realize I only have a few seconds left. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna make three remarks. There's a, an uncertainty, a certainty, and an admonition. The uncertainty is we actually have less clarity about our technological future now than we did 20 years ago. We had a fairly linear path of what computers could do, proceeding, uh, advancing on this kind of procedural programming idea, and now the terrain is wide open. It's easier to say what computers, it's harder to say what they can't do at this point than what they can do. So we don't really don't know. Anyone who tells you with certainty what's going to happen, you should ignore that person because there's, there's no knowing. Uh, the certainty is that it's going to open a lot of great possibilities for what is feasible in, in, in science, in medicine, right? Many good things could happen, but whether we successfully realize that possibility or just squander it or worse, uh, use it for terrible purposes is highly uncertain. And I would say fundamentally indeterminate. The admonition is given the vast applicability of these technologies to almost anything, we shouldn't just ask what it will do, but what we want it to do because it's really a terrain for us to shape. So our goal should not be merely to predict the future, but to create the future that we want to live in. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, David. I'm sure we'll come back to uh, some of the issues you just touched on. Uh, uh, Heather, uh, focusing uh, more specifically uh, on the case of the United States, why has inequality risen more in the US 
than in other advanced countries uh, that have been experiencing uh, similar uh, technological change. And, and if technological change has been having more inegalitarian uh, impacts in the United States than elsewhere, what factors uh, might explain that? Heather? Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Zia. Um, thank you for this question. And let me start by thanking you, John Allen, and the Brookings Institute for bringing us together today, um, virtually. Um, and it's great to follow David um, and his point that um, we want to create the future that we want to live in. Um, so let me turn to your question. Um, you know, as David just outlined, you know, new technologies and AI means that we do things differently. Um, so as new things are invented, new processes and businesses use and implement them, this alters the nature of jobs, what skills are needed, which ones are no longer useful to production processes, how that changes, as well as what firms or industries come out on top economically. And so the question isn't only what new technology and AI does, but how that is implemented and how societies structure their economic and social policies to support the kinds of inclusive growth that they wanna see. So um, when we look across industrial regions, across developed countries, there's a common decline in manufacturing employment shares. Um, Adam Posen, for example, has shown that Ohio, which has long been a manufacturing hub in the United States um, and its German equivalent have both seen similar declines in manufacturing employment shares since the 1990s. Yet the hollowing out of those jobs here in the United States has meant the hollowing out of middle-class income and a rise in inequality to a greater extent than in other countries. Indeed, um, as your question uh, uh, hints at, you know, for decades, the United States has seen relatively higher income and wealth inequality when compared to other advanced countries, all of whom have experienced similar changes in technology. So, for example, data from the World Inequality Database shows that in the United States, the top 1% share of pre-tax national income has roughly doubled from about 10% in the 1970s to about 19% in 2019, right before the pandemic began. By comparison, there have been little to no increases in the top 1% share in countries like Denmark, France, Germany, and Sweden over this same period. So a priori, it's hard to see how technological change could be the only driver of this widening gap in, in inequality. Otherwise, every country would have seen the same rate of inequitable outcome. So when we sort of scratch below the surface, we find that there's no one single institutional um, or, or cause of this divergence and in inequality. And indeed, looking more deeply at what's happened since the 1970s, I think we can see that institutional differences really better explain the sharp differences in inequality in the United States compared to our economic competitors, other developed countries. Um, compared to the United States in other developed countries, unions, and other forms of centralized wage bargaining play a larger role. These institutions tend to compress the wage distribution by lifting up wages at the bottom, containing them at the top, giving workers a voice. And while, of course, the United States has long had a minimum wage, its real value has been falling over time. And when we look at the scope of different countries' social insurance programs, this can also help illuminate why technology-induced shocks may look different in the United States than in other developed countries and the effect that that might have on inequality. For instance, um, unlike in other countries, when workers lose their jobs here, um, they have to worry about access to health insurance, how much that's gonna cost them, uh, unemployment benefits that are quick to expire and do not replace lost wages, and in fact, an unemployment in system that does not encourage firms to hold on to their workers and fewer supports on other fixed family expenses like childcare or college tuition or, unit or access to pre-kindergarten. And as we in other countries experience these technological shocks, um, other countries are more protective of their workers when they have layoffs or when their hours are cut through no fault of their own. Indeed, overall compared to other developed countries, the United States spends less as a share of GDP on active labor market policies like retraining or apprenticeship programs or job search and wage insurance. But we also have to explore not just whether these kinds of institutional structures um, that give workers a voice and create counterweights to concentrated economic power, but we also need to look at whether concentration at the top is contained. 
And I think here, you know, I would point to a couple of things along these lines. Um, economic research has been pointing to reduction in top uh, income tax rates, which give top earners a stronger incentive to bargain for firm rent, um, financial deregulation and differences in pay norms. And of course, um, we need to recognize the role that market concentration has played across advanced economies, in particular here in the U.S. Um, particularly, I think we're concerned that because AI requires large amount of data or can, highly trained engineers and large fixed costs, there's a concern that its increasing use will make it harder for startups to challenge incumbent firms or, or reduce market competition, thus reducing innovation and harming consumers, but also having effects on workers and communities. So without measures that help reduce unfair competition, smaller companies and entrepreneurs could become worse off, and that has effects, I think, going forward as we're thinking about inequality. So I'm looking forward to the next round where we talk about policy, but those are just a few of the things that we're thinking about in terms of the trends in inequality and technological change. Thanks very much. Uh, but turning to uh, developing economies, Kaushik, uh, while technological change uh, has been increasing in inequality uh, within advanced economies, is it having or will it, will it have a similar impact on inequality uh, within developing economies? As, as uh, digital technologies uh, and automation make uh, deeper inroads uh, into developing economies, uh, will they produce rising inequality and uh, diminish uh, job prospects uh, for these economies, uh, rapidly growing uh, low skill populations. Uh, your, your thoughts on that, Kaushik? Kaushik, you, you need to uh, unmute. Yes. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you very much. I had just thanked Brookings, so that's the only thing you had missed out on. Uh, yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Zia, um, my expectation, this was before the COVID, I was beginning to write that developing countries are going to go the same route as advanced economies. But now there is a difference and let me bring this in. I do believe that worldwide with the progress in technology, with the march of technology, especially digital technology, the demand for conventional labor is going to shrink we may solve this in the long run by thinking of new forms of labor for now. The trend is very visible in all advanced economies that the share of the national income going to workers is going down. What's happening, this is true actually of all advanced economies, of all higher middle income, upper middle income economies. For lower middle income economies and developing economies, it's not so marked. My earlier expectation was that this is going to gradually come to developing countries. So there is a window of 10 years or 15 years when the demand for labor globally begins to shrink. But because wages are low in developing countries, that shrinking demand for labor is going to come disproportionately to developing countries. What is going to happen is my expectation now is over the last year, and a half or two years, we've had something which once upon a time used to be written very academically by Ken Arrow and others, learning by doing. The learning by doing in terms of digital technology, the technology that was already there, we have learned its use in ways we, which we could not imagine. Having meetings, seminars, lectures around the world all by using digital technology. This is going to create something interesting, I believe. As the pandemic eases up, I feel in the beginning, there will be some advantage for developing economies because the outsourcing is going to increase because we are gaining so much mastery over digital technology that we will be able to make use of labor in India, in the Philippines, in Africa, different places, we will be able to use that. But this demand will continue to fall because of the march of technology. And this is going to ultimately come and it will probably after this initial boom, you will see the same trend coming into developing countries. And some of this is already visible. I know India very well. I track India's data. If you look at the percentage, the top 1% of India's richest people and the wealth owned by them, in 2012, it was 31%. In 2020, 
it is 42%. It's an unbelievable rise in concentration at the top that is taking place. And likewise, if you take the bottom 50% of wealth owners, it used to be 6% in 2012 owned by them. It's now down to 3%. So the inequality trend is already there. And I feel it's going to get worse unless we begin to think in terms of very, very different kinds of policies to intervene. So it is a challenge. It will come to developing countries with a lag. It's going to be a bit different across developing countries. When I watch now Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, different countries, depending on the kind of regulatory environment that they are in, they are being hit in different ways, but it is going to come to all of us and we will have to think of very radical policies at that point of time. Uh, thank you, uh, Kaushik. Uh, uh, so far, we have talked about uh, technology's impact on inequality uh, within uh, countries. While inequality within uh, many countries has been rising uh, in recent days, um, in recent decades, uh, inequality between uh, countries has been falling uh, thanks to the rise of uh, faster growing developing economies uh, that have been narrowing the uh, uh, income gap uh, with uh, advanced economies. So Danny, a question is, could automation and uh, digitalization slow or even reverse uh, this process of uh, economic convergence by altering patterns of comparative advantage uh, trade and growth. Uh, your, your thoughts, Danny? Um, thanks, Ia. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think um, that um, technology has had um, a sort of a mixed impact on this and, and will continue to have a mixed impact, uh, probably with a little bit more weighted on the negative side for developing countries. I, I think the, the fundamental issue here is that um, um, for developing countries historically, in fact, historically from the onset of modern economic growth, the, the foundation of modern economic growth has been uh, industrialization, pulling people out from the countryside um, into urban and manufacturing um, enterprises. Um, and, and that's been a, a fundamental source of, of rapid economic convergence for those countries that have been able uh, to latch onto that bandwagon. Um, the um, the advantage that many many developing countries had in manufacturing was based on the abundance of relatively low skilled and relatively cheap labor. Um, this was a period, especially in the post-war period, uh, when um, uh, manufacturing was, um, uh, was um, uh, very um, labor intensive for the most part and the world economy was uh, becoming uh, more easily accessible. Uh, so if you were getting onto the manufacturing bandwagon, uh, you know, neither supply side nor demand side constraints uh, bind it anymore because on the supply side, you had access to lots of cheap labor um, coming from the countryside. On the demand side, uh, as a small country, you had a whole world market uh, to serve. And that combination together with the ability to absorb technology from the advanced world meant that industrialization and manufacturing um, proved a very a potent um, engine uh, for rapid convergence and economic growth. And I think the, all the growth miracles and poverty reduction miracles of the post-war period essentially um, are, are based on that. So I think the fundamental attention that new technologies uh, bring to that picture or the complication uh, is that um, as uh, these technologies have evolved in a way that's increasingly more skill intensive and capital intensive in ways that David um, and others have, have described, uh, they fundamentally undermine the gains from trade of developing countries. So that's to say that they reduce the comparative advantage that developing countries have in labor intensive, tradable manufacturing goods. Um, so that's, a, that's in some sense that, you know, the first order economic logic here is that the gains from trade are being reduced. But it's not just the gains from trade. If you go back to the growth story, I just gave you the dynamic story, the ability of manufacturing to provide some kind of a, a conver convergence, a ladder, um, that, that I think the dynamic effects are also very strong and the ability of manufacturing to absorb lots of unskilled labor from the countryside has been diminished. So if you look at the last 30, 40 years with very few exceptions, um, 
uh, countries have not stopped to urbanize. So, you know, people are still moving from the countryside into urban areas, but by and large, uh, they are not finding jobs in factories, in formal registered modern manufacturing. Um, and instead they're ending up in informality in the urban areas, very precarious um, uh, jobs and so forth. So this is, so the, the underlying engine of structural change and growth and convergence, I think is now broken um, in part because of, of, of these technological trends. And I think uh, sort of the early gains from manufacturing spreading globally, uh, which has largely run its course, um, I think is now sort of the negative effect of the technological um, uh, disadvantages are starting to play a, a, a more of a, um, a, a negative a negative role in, in, in this. So this is the, it doesn't mean that convergence will not continue to happen, but I don't anticipate that you can have as rapid convergence as you did uh, in the East Asian or most of the other countries that rode this manufacturing bandwagon. I think countries that invest in their fundamentals, improve their institutions, invest in human skills, capital, um, you know, can still grow because of the, you know, fundamental forces of convergence. Um, you can, they can still grow more rapidly than the advanced countries. But what was really, um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, extraordinary in the post-war period of this very rapid convergence. I don't think we will be able to see that anymore. And that has actually implications also for, you know, in particular for low-income sub-Saharan African countries, because they still have a kind of an employment bulge um, at, or the uh, bulge of young workers in the urban areas. There's a question of where it will do jobs be created for them, if not in manufacturing. So I think that creates both a growth problem and a social problem in a lot of these countries. Zia, you're on mute. I'm unmuted now, thank you. So uh, let's turn to uh, our second round of questions uh, on the role of public policy. Uh, large increases in inequality are not a, a, a preordained outcome of technological change. Much depends on uh, the institutional context and uh, policy response. So a uh, question to you, David, is what can uh, public policy do? How can the promise of today's uh, digital advances be harnessed to promote more inclusive uh, economic outcomes? Uh, what institutional and policy adaptations are needed to disseminate uh, new technologies and uh, productive opportunities more widely across workers and uh, and, and and firms. Terrific. Okay. Um, so, super challenging question. Obviously, let me let me start what with what won't work. So, skills are necessary, but they're not sufficient. So, you know, labor economists like to say, well, you know, if we just skill them, the jobs will come, et cetera. And we have had a massive upskilling in throughout the industrialized world and the developing world over the last uh, multiple decades. The median worker is now much more educated than he or she was uh, 30 years ago, but he's, he or she is not much better paid. <laughs> so skills are necessary. They're not sufficient. Um, social supports are necessary. We need to have you know, as Heather emphasized, we need to have active labor market policies. You know, the, the U.S. spends 10% as much as a share of GDP as does Denmark on helping workers who are displaced to find, get new skills and get new work. Um, and social supports are job retraining, but also other forms of insurance, right? So we have, you know, when we had these trade shocks in the 2000s, particularly from China's rise, you know, we have a trade adjustment assistance program. It's small, it's somewhat stingy, it's hard to access. And why is it only about trade, right? I mean, why is trade privileged? You know, if you lose your job, do you really care why it's, you know, you've lost your jobs, you've, you've lost your livelihood and maybe your skills are no longer uh, have their same market value, we ought to be helping you. So that's important. Uh, redistribution is also necessary, but it's really not sufficient. And I do not think the notion that people are equally happy to get their income without their job uh, holds the notion that I'm, you can displace me from my coal mine, you can displace me from my manufacturing job, as long as I get a check, you know, postmark from Washington, D.C., I'm just as well off. That's crazy, right? People's identity is, is wrapped up 
in their work that provides, you know, uh, you know, uh, esteem. It provides a community. It provides a sense of purpose. And uh, so, redistribution is simply saying, well, whatever the market does, we'll just fix it with tax and transfers. That's just not going to work. Those things are incommensurate. Um, so let's talk about, you know, what we do. So first of all, I, I just want to build on a couple points that uh, Heather and, and Danny have made. Um, we really had, we benefited from a technological tailwind in the post-war decades that created lots of high paid work for people without high levels of education. Manufacturing just, we've never discovered anything else like it. I wish we had something like that. And many other countries have done that too. And now we, we no longer have that. We have a headwind. The tech, it's not the technology doesn't create, raise productivity and create benefits, but the set of people who tend to benefit are much more elite. Um, so that's a problem. Um, so, but you asked earlier, well, why hasn't the same thing happened in other countries exactly? And, and I agree with Heather fully that institutional differences make an enormous impact on how this unfolds. And they don't just affect the distribution of income, they affect incentives. So for example, when I was heading the work of the Future Task Force, you know, we spoke with the head of a large German manufacturing corporation and uh, talked to him about robotics. And he said, he says, yeah, you know, I could you know, buy robots that displace workers, you know, but that really isn't very much of interest to me because I still have those workers. I can't fire them. I have to retrain them. Uh, and so, you know, maybe in the long run, I could do that. In the short run, I'd rather have technology that helps those people be more productive. That's a better investment for me. And so, and it's because of unions, right? But it's not because the unions, it's not just the union say, well, this is what the wage structure is. Given that set of incentives, the technologies you're going to invest in are different. So, um, so let me, so, so let me kind of make two points um, that, uh, you know, try to answer this question about what do we do? How do we shape the future uh, to not create so much inequality and to create better opportunities? So one is, uh, you know, we need what, what some would call pre-distribution. We need to change market outcomes, not simply post-market tax and transfers. We need to be concerned about the quality of jobs available for people, the paycheck they receive for doing the work they do, the opportunities that follow from that, the level of economic security associated with that. And the U.S. does this remarkably badly uh, compared to almost any other rich country. So that, how do we do better? We do that better with bargaining, right? With better institutions for worker representation. I don't simply mean, you know, restore the AFL-CIO to its 1950s glory. I mean, bargaining for people in domestic work. I mean, bargaining for people, uh, you know, in uh, medical sector. I mean, in general, changing wage and pay setting norms and institutions. We need tax policy that encourages firms to invest in workers, not just in machines. But we also need to shape the technology itself. And, and we, we forget uh, how much we actually do that already. So think of the space race, for example, you know, which basically, I mean, I don't know, when I was a kid in high school, uh, or maybe it was earlier, my math books were, were stamped that said the Kennedy administration, uh, you know, NASA initiative, blah, blah, has paid for this textbook. And basically, as part of the space race, there was a big investment in science education in the United States, in STEM education. Um, we do this with DARPA. Right, the advanced research, defense advanced research, you know, it has pushed robotics, it's pushed self driving cars, which is good. I'm not, uh, those are all good technologies. I'd like to see that for health as well. And if you want to see an example of a country shaping technology, right, China leads the world in facial recognition technology and surveillance technology, right? That's not an accident. That's where they've put their AI money, right? And they're working, it's working. I mean, you know, I'm not in favor of the way it's working, but it's working well. They're getting what they want, they want out of the investment and the technology is going in the direction they want it to go. So we should recognize that if we want technologies that augment healthcare delivery, that augment workers and other, you know, that's not gonna happen by access, not just people sitting at a lab bench going Eureka, it's we create incentives to get what we want. We tend to get what we're seeking. I'll stop there, thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, uh, nice uh, segue uh, to uh, next question uh, for Heather, uh, focusing again on the uh, on the United States. Uh, how is the uh, the U.S. responding to uh, the challenge of rising inequality associated with technological change? David uh, touched on uh, some of those elements already. Uh, so, what do you see as the key elements, and in terms of policy, and uh, what more needs to be done? Heather? Yeah, thank you, Zia. Um, I'm so enjoying this panel and especially enjoying this um, connecting the dots between economic advancement here in the United States alongside the challenges in the developing and newly industrialized world. 
Um, so the segues are really lovely. Um, so following on what, what David said, you know, currently the United States does not have the kinds of infrastructure to help workers adjust to strong supply side shocks. That's of course been the, you know, a focal point of his research. And as we sort of translate that, that into policy, um, I wanna talk about the few things that the Biden administration has been focused on. Um, you know, instead of relying on the kinds of programs that um, don't work, we need programs that will allow workers, I mean, so for example, when you think about the China shock, um, you know, we need programs that will allow workers to be retrained and supported as they transition to new industries or jobs. And as David noted, and I noted, you know, we, we know that there are these differences in the United States in our social insurance and active labor market policies. And, you know, a core set of agenda items within the President's Build Back Better agenda really focus on these pieces. So, for example, um, Build Back Better increases the Department of Labor's workforce development budget by 50% for the next five years. And it makes evidence-based investments in community colleges, sector-based job training, and apprenticeship programs, especially um, focusing on underserved communities. So these are ways that Build Back Better um, is focused on building up the resilience of the American labor force and communities um, to build to uh, allow everyone to um, take advantage of new technologies and to bring everyone along as we do that. But we also have to be thinking about how the United States can do more um, to address these um, technology-related challenges. Um, and, and we really do need to be thinking about the role of place-based and industrial policies. And I think these get to some of the pre-distribution questions that David brought up. I mean, there's a variety of ways to think about pre-distribution, um, but one of them I think is, or a couple of them are set, you know, thinking about places and thinking about industries. So um, we know that, you know, in the United States, shocks induced by technological change will continue to have impacts that are spatially and industrially concentrated. And, um, you know, we need to recognize that certain regions, certain industries are going to be hit harder um, by technological changes. And then we need to figure out ways to make sure that they are not left behind. Um, so, you know, to take this another way, let's sort of focus on what I think is a bit of the elephant in the room when we're talking about technology these days, which is the necessary but bumpy economic transition from fossil fuels to clean energy sources. So we talk about AI and these, um, you know, one set of technologies, but the technology that, that I think um, we would all agree we really need to advance humanity um, is to make sure that we're moving towards a carbon neutral, um, uh, carbon neutral sources of energy. And we think that these could um, create jobs um, as, the, as we change the way we produce and use energy. Um, and indeed, um, Build Back Better provides strong tax incentives for American-made electronic vehicles, um, built-in union factories, as well as for clean energy produced using American-made equipment like solar panels and wind turbines. But as that transition occurs, as we develop and use these new technologies, what is going to happen to the towns that currently produce gas-powered vehicles, um, vehicles that rely on internal combustion engines? Letting these factories close, leaving people without jobs and saying, good luck, um, really cannot be our guiding path forward. I think when I think about these challenges, I often think of David's work with his colleagues about the China shock and you know, how is this transition across sectors across the economy, but just focusing for a moment on automobiles, how is it gonna affect all of those communities across the country? What will that mean for inequality across place and across different kinds of workers? So um, Build Back Better really does focus on making localized and targeted investments in electric vehicle production that can support the industrial transition and reduce that local economic disruption. But that's only one example of how place-based policies focusing on distressed communities can be useful in responding to inequality and technological change. Um, you can think of the, um, the rising importance, as we've all learned, especially over the past couple of years, the rising importance of broadband, um, you know, to allow people to telecommute to jobs around the country, or around the world, um, to allow uh, businesses to conduct their business, um, you know, or uh, the role of transportation networks and connecting workers with their jobs. So the bipartisan infrastructure law that has been already passed um, and the president signed um, into law a couple of weeks ago, this will invest $60 billion in broadband and $49 billion in public transit, much of which is focused on improving disadvantaged workers' access to jobs. 
And then, of course, there are investments um, in industries that support the development of human capital in sectors that are difficult to replace with technology, like quality childcare, universal pre-K, um, uh, and the like. Um, that I think are also an important piece of this puzzle when we're thinking about inequality in technology, what kinds of sectors are less affected and how can we make sure that we're shoring those up and making sure that those are good jobs. Finally, I wanna note that policies that address market concentration are really an important part of the suite of actions that the government can take um, while confronting rising inequality and technology-induced shocks. Um, meeting these challenges requires a robust and innovative approaches to competition policy, and that's why the president's executive order around competition, um, which he put in place a few months ago, it establishes a whole of government approach to push back on decades of declines in competition and really works to ensure that across the federal government, um, we are focusing on reducing market competition and encouraging widely shared growth. I want to just end by noting that I think one of the key challenges in this moment for the U.S. is really recognizing that there isn't just one magic bullet to solving rising inequality, addressing the way technology affects the production and use of capital across, uh, across places across the United States, but that we really do need to be thinking about this basket of policies, and that is what the president's agenda around Build Back Better is designed to do. Thank you, Zia. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Heather. It was very useful. Uh, uh, Danny, uh, going back to uh, uh, developing economies in terms of the uh, challenges uh, that, uh, that you laid out, uh, what uh, policy choices uh, do these economies face uh, in, the, in the digital age? Uh, do today's uh, technological transformations call for a major uh, recalibration of their growth models? as these technologies uh, disrupt uh, traditional uh, pathways to development? Yeah, um, uh, I'll, I'll answer that. But before I, I come to the specific policies um, for developing countries, I want to draw one implication of um, uh, what uh, David and Heather said, uh, in particular with regard to um, you know, not taking the direction of technological changes given and understanding that, that you can steer the direction of technological innovation, that our policies, our tax regimes, our institutions, our the norms that exist in Silicon Valley and the, the innovators community um, has a lot to do with the types of, of uh, uh, technologies that we generate. And because developing countries are importers of technology, they basically adopt whatever is out there. There's a huge global externality, if you will, or a huge sort of source of a global public good uh, that we need to insert into our discussions here as to whether the, the technologies that are being um, developed are um, not only appropriate for labor markets um, and the economies of the advanced countries, but also for developing countries as well. The fact is that, you know, when you know, um, you know, uh, Adidas or or Reebok are are, are investing in three D printing to develop, um, uh, you know, sort of new shoes, new sneakers. Uh, you know, the, it's not just because three D printing provides advantages in terms of, you know, quicker development of prototypes, greater customization, and so forth, and things that you can do with three D printing but also because they get a big you know, tax break when you invest in capital equipment. Whereas when you're employing labor, you're actually getting all these labor charges. Labor is expensive, you know, capital is cheap. Um, and uh, so I think this externality in the kinds of, of you know, the development and, and adoption of technology that, that the innovators and the investors and firms are not internalizing the labor market and social consequences of not generating enough jobs um, is, to my mind really is the second biggest externality, negative externality in the world economy today after climate change externalities. And it's an externality which we don't talk about um, that because we simply take the direction of technological change, what innovators do as essentially largely something outside our control. So I think the first thing I wanna mention is that, that we need to think about um, how we're thinking about the direction of technological change as an issue as, as a potential global conversation as a source of global public goods and bads. Um, uh, coming to specifically to the, um, to the um, 
policies of the developing countries, I do think there is a fundamental rethinking that's needed. That if we are moving into a world where in fact, um, uh, export oriented industrialization is no longer going to be the engine of, of growth in the way that it was, it um, necessarily entails a different path. You know, sort of when finance ministers and trade and industry ministers and development ministers in the developing world today are thinking about how to unlock growth, they're typically thinking about how can they insert themselves into global value chains, how they can, um, you know, create export champions, um, how they can diversify into new exports. Uh, I think all these were all the right questions maybe 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but I don't think these are the right questions today because um, the, the bulk of the jobs that will need to be created will not come in manufacturing and export oriented tradable sectors. Uh, the bulk of them will come essentially in domestic services um, and will be, um, and, and therefore the focus of policy will have to be in these countries much more. You know, how do I move people from precarity in the informal sector? Uh, to somewhat more productive jobs um, in the organized um, uh, sort of you know, medium and small enterprises, but who are largely pro producing for the domestic home market, they're producing services, they're not producing for exports for tradable. Um, so that entails a very different um, approach to economic development policy that's going to be much more services focused, much more focused towards developing the domestic middle class so they can generate demand for these domestic services, much more focused on small and medium-sized enterprises as opposed to export champions and the established firms. Um, so it's a very different type of a growth strategy. Um, you know, I, I don't think you're going to get as much growth as you did under the old export-oriented industrialization model because you don't have that export uh, vent for surplus uh, ability anymore. Uh, but if you take into account the need that you both need to generate more productivity jobs and you need to generate more employment, um, I think the, the focus will have to, to move increasingly towards uh, domestic services and medium and small enterprises, um, a very different segment of the economy than what um, you know, policymakers who worry about growth used to do until recently. Thank you, Danny. Uh, another uh, nice uh, segue uh, to the next question uh, uh, to Koshik. Uh, uh, how do you see the, the current juncture uh, that we've been discussing uh, in a historical perspective? Uh, technological transformations and their impacts uh, during the Industrial Revolution uh, led to some radical reforms in economic and social policies. With today's digital revolution, are we at a similar turning point calling for a major rethink of policies? Yeah, um, actually, I I'm glad you mentioned the Industrial Revolution. Uh, I used to take a lot of interest in that because of my early interest in child labor. But what I'm struck today is by, in terms of the parallels of concerns, it was very different from our current digital revolution, but there are parallels of concern. So I'm glad you bring this up. You know, the industrial revolution in retrospect was all good. We are much better off today. The whole world is connected. We've got huge benefits out of that. What we forget is that actually for the first 70, 80 years of the industrial revolution, that was not the case. Our skies were getting dark with soot being spewed out into the skies. The poor workers were working very hard, but were very badly off. Child labor, children as young as eight years, 10 years, 12 years, working for 12 hours a day. And, and if you read descriptions of that period, it was horrifying. It was not at all axiomatic that we would benefit from the technological revolution, which in some sense is an advance. We did come out of it well for two reasons. One is dramatic changes in economic theory. And by theory, I, I don't mean theorems and axioms. But our understanding of the economy from Adam Smith to Ricardo to John Stuart Mill all taking place more or less with the industrial revolution. And I do believe that it is a moment of novel theoretical thinking for economics, but also policy. Industrial revolution, we forget today things which today seem completely normal and natural. There were policies coming in which at that time looked completely radical and there was a lot of opposition. And just if you think of Robert Peel's act from early 19th century, 1802, 1803, 
uh, restrictions of number of hours of work, workplace regulation, children cannot work. All this seems completely natural now. It did not look that way. The income tax, which is a completely a part of our society, when it came in for the first time, there was occasional taxing for reasons of war. But when it came in properly for the first time in 1842 in Britain, if you read some of the writings that this is outrageous what the government is doing, it is a time for us today to think in terms of outrageous policies. And I'm glad Danny mentioned that fundamental changes is what we need. What fundamental changes? We will continue to speculate. I want to just put a couple of things on the table because it is such a novel time. We will have to do novel thinking and understanding the economy and also in terms of policies. A couple of these are relatively easy, and this has already been referred to. Education, the nature of skill building has to be very, very different because mechanical work is going to be taken away. We have to teach and train our children for novel kinds of work. Creative thinking is going to be much more important and societies that are beginning to invest in training children along those lines will be the societies that do better. But beyond that, we also will need other kinds of radical changes. Maybe I have a bit of a disagreement here with David, if I understood you right. Let, let me bring this to the table. I feel that it's not just the quality of work and income from work. Some of this will have to be plain simple sitting back and earning incomes, which are being transferred by mechanisms which have been created, which will play an important role. To say that workers, you will hurt their sense of dignity if they just get a transfer of income or earn from shares that they own. I don't agree because for long stretches in history, feudal lords would be sitting back and earning the income being generated by their serfs. We did not feel bad about the psychology of the feudal lords being damaged, their dignity being damaged by the fact that they were sitting back and earning income. So I feel, David, we will have to allow people to earn. And here, let me put one or two concrete, at this stage, nothing more than ideas. One is, for the big digital platforms, amassing massive amounts of income, yes, antitrust law, Heather mentioned some of this, the greater competition is extremely important. Lena Khan has done prominent work on this. A whole lot of people have called for this. But I don't think that's enough. I don't think antitrust law is going to work because when you have these huge economies of scale as the Sherman Act understood at that point, you can't just solve it by greater competition because there isn't scope for that because the economies of scale is the advantage. What do you do there? One thing that we have to think of, even if, if these mega firms earn mega profits, if there is dispersed shareholding, you have laws that prevent a few people to own these big firms, the shareholding has to be dispersed. Then the big profits will not matter as much because the profits will be going into many, many pockets. So we will new, need new laws about dispersed shareholdings where there'll be laws saying that you can't own more than this much amount of shares of these firms. Maybe in the beginning you can because you want to encourage innovation, people investing, but after 14 years, like patterns run out, you have to have dispersed shareholding, which will be owned by lots of people. Number two, this sounds very radical now, and there's a risk of misunderstanding. Some of the biggest platforms, depending on the nature, might in the long run have to become nonprofit organizations. So, and I'm not saying this for everything. I do know profit plays an important role. Enterprise plays an important role. But think of things like central banks, we forget that Bank of England in the 17th century was a private for-profit organization. And there were, I think, 1,200 shareholders who earned profits from the running of Bank of England. India's Reserve Bank of India in 1934 was a profit-making body. It would be changed 15 years later. These were profit-making bodies. At some point, you realize that if you are such a big corporation that people's survival in the economy is to get onto your platform, like money. You need money to be a part of the in, uh, uh, economic environment of a society. You can't have that as a profit-making body. We have to think of a couple of the biggest platforms, 
where to survive, you have to be a part of the platform. Very, very novel um, policy interventions. I don't quite know what the details will be. These things will have to be debated because we've made big mistakes in the past by going in for what policies which look like good policies. We went in for that and they backfired. USSR is full of policies of that kind. You can't make those mistakes. These are dangerous, risky policies, but we are at a juncture like in the industrial revolution. We will have to think of novel ideas which could make once again this digital revolution something which we will celebrate in retrospect because we are so much better off, so much more equitable a society as a consequence of that. Let me stop. Uh, thank you, Kaushik. Uh, some uh, provocative uh, thoughts there. Uh, David, you were mentioned, but I will come back to you. You, uh, to, you, you will have an opportunity to, to uh, respond to that or, or add to that. Uh, uh, but in the interest of time, uh, we need to uh, move on now to our uh, third uh, set of questions on the implications uh, of rising inequality uh, for democratic governance. Uh, 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 as you know, rising uh, inequality and related disparities and anxieties uh, have been stoking uh, uh, social discontent and they are an important driver of the uh, increased uh, popular disaffection, uh, political polarization, and uh, nationalist populism uh, that we today, see today. And an increasingly unequal uh, society can weaken trust in public institutions, uh, fray social contract, uh, and undermine uh, democratic governance. Uh, a squeezed middle class can weaken a key pillar of a democratic role. Uh, so there are these risks. And uh, let me add here uh, for a uh, historical perspective that uh, history uh, warns us about the uh, political consequences of large and unchecked increases in e economic inequalities and the related disparities. Uh, uh, as you would know, uh, Walter Scheidel, a historian at Stanford, in uh, his 2017 book, uh, The Great Leveler, uh, the full title is The Great Leveler of Violence and the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century, says that past episodes of high and persistent inequality have typically been followed by political upheavals or other shocks to the system uh, that he calls the four horsemen of leveling, uh, namely wars, uh, political revolutions, state collapse, and pandemics. So I don't want to sound alarmist, uh, but uh, this kind of historical perspective is, is useful. So how do our panelists assess uh, socio-political uh, risks for democratic societies if the technologies of today and tomorrow continue to produce large and persistent uh, increases in economic inequality. Given the limited time, I will ask uh, each of you, please, to uh, uh, share your thoughts for two to three minutes each so that uh, we can then uh, go to uh, viewers' questions. Uh, let's start with, uh, with you, David. Okay, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of this session. I won't respond directly to Kashik now, but I, I appreciate the, uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to, to sort of flesh out these issues. This is really valuable. So let me um, slightly question the, the premise of the question. I mean, I've done work on inequality and, and you know, uh, polarization and so on, but I actually think the tensions are more fundamental than just the economic shocks. And I wish they weren't because I think the economic issues are easier to deal with. I think there's actually a, 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 a major cultural divergence that was papered over by eco shared economic interests. So this is the, you know, what's the matter with Kansas hypothesis? You know, why do people in the South, in red states vote against their economic interests? And, and I think, you know, there's actually recent work uh, and I won't go into detail by uh, on NAFTA, for example, that shows uh, that, you know, prior to the NAFTA trade shock, uh, the values of low of non-college workers had completely realigned to the Republican party towards anti-immigration, towards anti-abortion. But the thing that kept them in the democratic party was unions and protection against trade. 
And when NAFTA occurred, it actually did create a very large shock to trade impacted locations. And the votes flipped very quickly uh, from uh, of non-college workers from left to right. But in some sense, the pump was primed. And this is happening throughout the developed world. Countries that have no increase in inequality are having huge increases in nationalism and radical politics. France, Austria, Switzerland, Denmark, Belgium, Finland, Sweden, Germany, Norway, all of these countries have right, rising rightist parties without much rise in inequality. Um, and so I think there's a, a very fundamental deep problem that will not unfortunately be resolved by simply you know, reversing the tide of inequality or even slowing it. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm deeply worried, deeply worried about the question you're asking, but I don't feel that I know that inequality is the fundamental source. And certainly I don't know that fixing inequality will fix this problem. Sorry, we go to Heather now. Sure. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, you know, I'm an economist first, not a political scientist, but um, I think that that um, I think David has made an interesting point uh, that there are um, problems with democracy in places that have not seen the rise in inequality that the United States has seen. I do think, though, that there are a couple of um, sort of grounding concepts here that I would point to. Um, you know, first, um, which I think Zia, you mentioned in your opening question around um, trust. And um, trust is, you know, as we all know, it's difficult to build up and easy to um, easy to, to chip away at. Um, and I think that that when you think about the U.S. case, the question that that I would ask in um, in relation to what's been happening with the economy, inequality, and trust, and uh, political outcomes, is who's been benefiting from economic growth, and who was setting the rules of the game that, um, that determined who was benefiting from economic growth. Um, you know, I am really struck uh, uh, every time I look at the um, Piketty and Sias data, when you, um, you, know, you look over the period uh, of the 1960s and 70s, and you see this, in it, this um, uh, growth in the United States that's fairly robust and that we are literally a country that was growing together. When the economy grew, when you sort of look at it from a national income perspective, when the economy grew, it was those at the bottom that saw the most growth and those at the top that saw the, the slowest pace of growth. Um, and, and most people in the United States were seeing their incomes grow at about the same rate. Um, so uh, the last time I looked at it over those periods, it was like two thirds all saw their incomes growing at about the same pace. And that's just been so different since 1980, which I think gets to David's point that this isn't just something that emerged really quickly. This I think has been something that's been changing over time, that we've been a nation that's been growing apart. So now when the, you know, when you, you know, you get that GDP data and you see, wow, the economy has grown by three or 4%, we now know that the bulk of that is going to people at the top and that we are a country now that's growing apart. Those at the top are gaining, everybody else isn't. And so that's not a question so much about levels. I mean, the United States, we're a fairly rich country. Um, so um, the, you know, that sense that, that there isn't that shared purpose or that shared um, uh, uh, experience in what the economy is delivering. And I would tie that to some of the things that you know, we've already talked about in terms of competition, who is gaining from growth, who's setting up the rules of what the economy is for, and who's benefiting. Um, I will just say that one of the things that I'm most proud of about being able to work for President Biden is that I can, um, I can honestly say that his goal is to, grow, is to have an economy that delivers for America's middle class, that it broadens and that it strengthens it. And that is the purpose of our economic policy. Um, and so that goal is very clear. So when he goes out there and says, we're not gonna raise taxes on anybody making less than $400,000 a year, we uh, can have a long conversation about whether or not the middle class goes all the way up to 400,000 all across the country. But we are um, focused on making sure that those at the top pay, we're, making, we're focused on making sure that um, certain firms cannot um, make the rules for themselves. And I do think that all of that does affect our democracy. So I have like gone back to my comfortable space of talking about economics, but I do think that you know, when we're understanding the effect of polarization um, economically, I think that the political scientists, if, if we got five of them on this call, um, I think there's a lot of evidence that that does affect political outcomes in really important and potent ways. And it's about trust. Who are your policies benefiting and are they benefiting me and my community? Thank you, uh, Danny. 
Yeah, um, uh, I, I think when we're thinking about the rise of um, anti-democratic politics and, and, and authoritarian populism, we need to think both about the, the demand side of, of politics as well as the supply side. On the demand side, I think clearly many of the economic shocks that we have experienced, whether it's the NAFTA shock, the China trade shock, the you know, financial crisis and, and, and housing shocks in the US and the austerity shocks in, in Europe, you know, they've all been found to be sort of, you know, um, correlated with uh, the geography of support for, um, uh, you know, right-wing populists. And of course, David um, has done some of the best work here. Um, uh, but there is also the, the 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 fact that we need to ask why is it that you know populist parties have been the ones who take advantage of these economic um, uh, shocks? That's where we need to turn to uh, the supply side of politics, the programs, uh, the remedies that uh, established politicians and po political parties, the parties at the center and center left have offered. And I think you know, frankly, until Biden, I think. Um, you know, certainly in the United States, the Democratic Party fell short. In, 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 in Europe, uh, the socialist parties, the parties of the center left fell short. They were very much in the throes of, um, you know, neoliberalism. Uh, you know, I think, you know, sort of some of the strongest proponents of neoliberalism in Europe were, of course, parties of, of the socialist parties in Europe or the Social Democratic Party in Germany or Labour Party under Blair in, in the UK. Um, you know, Clinton Democrats, you know, it's, you know, NAFTA took place under Clinton, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, there was, you know, there was this increasing disconnect uh, between sort of the remedies and the approaches of the central left in the established democracies and lower middle class um, uh, uh, voters and in particular parts of the countries that were being very adversely hit by these economic shocks and also by sort of, you know, the kinds of things that technology, um, deindustrialization and so forth uh, um, uh, uh, created. So I think maybe this is changing, you know, I think Biden's, the economic agenda of, of Biden and, and uh, what Heather is working for is extremely encouraging. But from some distance, frankly, I see that there is still a a battle for the soul of the Democratic Party. I mean, the Democratic Party, will it be the party of the middle class and the lower middle class and, and speak to the economic concerns, the bread and butter issues of everything that we're talking about here? Or will it appeal to the values of the, the more professional elites, the coastal um, uh, uh, elites and, 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 and uh, um, uh, high tech and, and, and finance? I mean, those are that's, I think, still very much an issue for the Democratic Party as I see it. And it doesn't seem to have been quite resolved. What will the Social Democrats do in Germany today? I mean, the new, the new um, uh, um, um, prime minister has taken over. Will they have um, a, an appropriate remedy? Uh, so I think the supply side, so what's on supply, what, what programs we have uh, to offer uh, to those who are uh, primarily um, affected negatively by these. I think that, you know, these globalization shocks are mostly problems of the past, but increasingly the kind of these shocks having to do with technological change, innovation, um, and, and the need, the challenge to create good jobs, particularly in those parts of the country that have been left behind. I think those are fundamental issues. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Kaushik? So yeah, this is probably the hardest part uh, of the discussion, uh, this uh, global democracy. Um, and listening to even the evening news, when you just pick up from what's happening around the world, it's just shocking, uh, the rise in hyper-nationalism. Uh, I agree with um, David pointing out that the inequality, the economics is not an, enough of an explanation of what's happening. To me, the inequality is bad in itself. We have to do something directly about it. But we are not going to solve this problem of the rise in hyper-nationalism. It's very difficult to understand quite where it is coming from. One possible conjecture is that uh, as um, the world is getting economically globalized and the politics remains balkanized in nations, there's some tension that is arising out of that, which is heightening hyper-nationalism, the rightist tendencies in countries that actually haven't seen any great rise in inequality within themselves, but you have this rise. This is a challenge that we have to turn to. So I really have no answer on this. I'm completely baffled in the evenings, just watching what's happening in Belarus, Myanmar, around the world. You get shocked at the rise of what is going on. Maybe this is a time, and this uh, goes into Heather's domain a little bit, Global democracy is something that democratic countries have to collectively work towards. 
which is things like uh, worldwide, you need a minimal constitution, certain rules of the game that we agree to. We can go no farther than that because we don't have institutions for anything more than that. But just like the constitution, building some basic rules for a nation has been extremely important in the United States and around the world. We are at a juncture where just multilateral organizations and institutions are not enough. You need a minimal global constitution, very hard to work on. And we don't even understand this full interface between what is happening politically and what is happening on the economic front. But arguably, this is the biggest challenge that we are facing today. It's very open-ended. I know uh, what I'm saying, but I have to leave it at that because I don't have a more concrete uh, thought or suggestion on this. Yeah, thank you. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's a big, uh, complex subject, but uh, I think uh, uh, your observations have been uh, very thoughtful and, uh, and, and, and useful. Uh, in, uh, we have uh, uh, about 15 minutes left uh, for uh, taking up some of the questions uh, we, we have received. And, and, and thank you to the panelists for adhering to the uh, time limits for, for your answers. It's much appreciated. Uh, so uh, we can't, uh, of course, uh, uh, go through all the questions we have. But let me start with uh, with this one, uh, David. You you have already sort of touched on on, on these issues, uh, uh, but uh, there are several questions that revolve around uh, the following issues. Uh, uh, that uh, while economies in the past have always shown an ability to create new jobs uh, to replace those lost to automation, will the coming wave of robotics and AI? be much more powerful than any forms of automation we have seen to date and hurt workers more in terms of jobs and earnings, especially if these technologies have the effect of replacing rather than augmenting labor. So in other words, the question is, will this time be different? David, yeah, uh, great question. Two short answers, two to three minutes, thank you. Okay. Great. So, I mean, so yes, it will be different. Every time is different. It's important to remember. So there's not been one era of technology. There have been many. Um, I do think in the case of AI, it is the rate of progress is pretty astounding. And so I'm more, you know, I although it, cre it has potentially create lots of benefits, the amount of disruption may be larger. I think that's my concern. I can't say it with certainty, but the rate of improvement is remarkable. We really don't know what it can't do at this point. Robotics, I'm not nearly as concerned about. It just, it's a much slower moving technology. I mean, I, first of all, lots of benefits. So, um, and I, so let me say, I, I think there's reason for concern. It's not primarily about technological joblessness. It's about the devaluation of skills. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of people who aren't working at present, not because there are no jobs, but because the jobs are, they kind of suck and the wages are really low and people don't want to do them. Uh, wages are arguably too low in the United States to attract people into the workforce, in fact, in many ways. So I, I don't think we're going to run into vast technological unemployment, but that's not, but we see, we, if we see, see vast declines in the set of job opportunities available to people without high levels of education, uh, which we have seen, then that's just as bad. Um, so, so I think, you know, I guess that was not a comforting answer. I don't think we're running out of work. The quality of work is changing. It could change faster uh, because of artificial intelligence specifically. It may be more disruptive to the professions than other places, but uh, that remains to be seen. Sorry, that's not an encouraging answer. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, there were a few questions uh, on the uh, interplay um, between. Yeah, could I weigh in on that? Sorry. Could I weigh in on that question? Would that be okay? Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Just briefly. Um, thanks. With Zoom, it's hard to, you don't want to be rude. Right. Right? Um, so, I, I mean, I will just note, you know, David, I wrote down what David said um, in his first opening remarks that we want to create the future we want to live in. And I do think it's worth remembering whenever we're talking about these, you know, is technology going to take all the jobs? It, it feels like we're sort of going to this doomsday scenario. And I'm really confused as to who's going to buy all the stuff that this AI and these robots are producing if we have actually, if we actually go as far along that I think people 
to have in the back of their heads um, because the economy is based on me needing, I have to have something to, to ask for something or is it this mass immiseration, which it seems humans are very resilient. So I just wanted to remind us of that. But then second, I wanna bring us back to the fact that we do have this incredible um, need for new technologies around climate change that I think, I mean, right, there's, there's a lot of different estimates, but there are a lot of different ways that that is also going to create a lot of different jobs and opportunities, right? Instead of just pulling energy out of the ground, we're trying to find new ways to make it. I mean, time will tell how that, how that works, but I do think, you know, we've got these multiple transitions going on at the same time. And I think one theme of this panel is as we're thinking about how we want technology to be useful for humans moving forward, making sure that we're thinking about the things that need to be invented so that we can still have humanity because we have a planet that's inhabitable because we've addressed the climate challenge feels like a really important piece that this, um, this, the technology and inequality conversation needs to be integrating. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so uh, th there were a few questions, uh, uh, on the interplay between globalization and robotics or uh, what uh, uh, Richard uh, Baldwin has termed uh, globotics. Uh, so the question uh, or the set of questions uh, revolving around this is uh, that will, because of glo globotics, uh, white collar service jobs become much more internationally tradable than before? Uh, so placing uh, white collar workers at much greater risk of displacement from competition from across borders in the future than up to now when such uh, displacement risks affected mainly uh, blue collar workers. Uh, so uh, Denny, would you, would you take that or or, or David? It depends on whether you look at the, I mean, you can look at this question from the standpoint of uh, the advanced countries where, you know, there's some of that has been happening. And I think, uh, I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's, you know, you have now radiologists working in India, there are sort of, you know, reading x-rays um, and and presumably that's uh, has some, it had some effect on labor market prospects of radiologists in the United States. You can imagine some of that growing. I think, you know, from developing country perspective, some countries have tried to um, sort of like India and the Philippines are probably the two countries that have had the, the most success in terms of, um, you know, benefit, you know, sort of, you know, taking part in the global trade and services and call centers and business process outsourcing and so forth. It doesn't do a whole lot for development, quite frankly, because you know, the fundamental problem is that most of these jobs that are created in developing countries uh, is not in line with the underlying you know, factor endowments of those countries. We need jobs there for people who are relatively less educated and lower skills. And even in India and Philippines, which have large enclaves of this group, I mean, it has not been a major driver of growth because of, you know, essentially it, it's, it's a very small part of the labor force that can uh, take part in, 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 in these opportunities other than through some trickle down fashion in terms of, you know, um, so it's, um, uh, so that's, you know, that's, I, I think, but again, I want to come back to this thing that both Heather and David said, which is that all these questions are framing it in the form, you know, how do we adjust to these things in, in, in technology? You know, all this discussion about technology is about, you know, technology is something that's happening out there and our labor markets and our arrangements, our societies have to adjust to it. You know, this is, you know, we, we should get out of this framing, you know, technology is happening in a particular way because, we are pushing it in a party you know, where society is, you know, let's try to think about it, not just how society and labor markets can adjust to technology, but how can technology adjust to society and our needs too? You know, so let's try to meet, you know, halfway rather than assuming that all the adjustment has to come on the part of labor markets and societies. Yeah, I think that, that's indeed an important point, uh, Danny. Uh, uh, anyone uh, else on this, or uh, there are a couple of other questions I would like to move to before we end. Uh, 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 so uh, I think we have already touched on this. I mean, there are uh, some questions uh, on the sort of balance between uh, what some of you have referred to as uh, 
pre-distribution and uh, redistribution policies where the right balance is. Of course, it, uh, it depends on, uh, to some extent, on the uh, country context, but, but any thoughts on that uh, from anyone? I'll make one remark on that, um, which is that, you know, I, I mentioned before how the, the shape of institutions affects you know, the technology, so in the German context, what robots they adopt. It's also the case that the, um, the, the institutions also affect people's willingness to accept technology. So for example, Sweden is a country that has lots and lots of robots and they invest heavily in robots and nobody's worried about robots. Uh, and it's not because robots aren't changing the way mining is done or reducing labor input, but the assumption is, well, if the company gets more profitable, we'll keep our jobs and therefore our wages will go up. Whereas in the US, the assumption is, well, if the company gets more profitable and we don't, they need fewer workers, they'll fire us uh, and, the, and the owners will get wealthier. And so you know, people's expectation about how the profits will be used affects their willingness to accept the technology and the policies that go along with it. So we have created a situation where every, you know, in sort of a cowboy capitalism society like the US, the fact that, that a lot of value is created does not have any expectation that most people will benefit from that. And so it is kind of a recipe for, uh, you know, a lot of political, political uh, backlash and, and legitimate angst about, you know, the way, the way why the, the change will not uh, be widely beneficial. Anyone else? Uh... Okay, um, uh, I, I think uh, part of the reason uh, people, some, some of the uh, uh, viewers uh, ask this question is that uh, often in a, when you discuss inequality, people uh, instinctively or, or, or at least uh, in the first instance move to uh, redistribution policies. They immediately think in terms of tax and transfer policy. Uh, so, uh, so that brings in uh, in this question of well, what about uh, pre-distribution? What what can we do to make the uh, the growth process itself, as it's influenced by technology, uh, more inclusive? Uh, the uh, uh, Koshik, the, the uh, is a question on something that I think you uh, you you touched on uh, uh, that if if the new technologies uh, favor capital and are shifting income from labor to capital, are there ways that can be considered to broaden the ownership of capital uh, so more can share in the increased income flowing to capital? Uzia, one form of maybe pre-distribution is um, um, profit sharing. Idea go, goes back to Marty Weitzman who was writing about it academically, but I think we are at a juncture where we have to think of, because my own hunch is, traditional work demand is going to go down. Uh, this will have to be replaced with two kinds of things, much more creative work being done by workers. So for instance, even research, if a larger part of the population is engaged in research, it'll be like research is, a lot of it will be very wasteful work. Occasionally you will get a breakthrough, but that is the research world. And more and more of the world may become engaged in this because Artificial intelligence can't take this over very quickly. But if traditional labor is going down, one of the things that we may have to think of is ownership of a part of the capital is collectively done by people. And this is the old profit sharing idea where yes, you're sitting back and earning, but a whole lot of very rich people earn exactly in that manner. You own shares and you earn out of that. And we have to think in terms of Marty Weitzman's ideas, but put in much more sort of practical ways, the ways in which you can do that. And that will still Zia, leave one very big challenge open. At best, we will be able to do this at the level of each nation grappling with it and thinking of profit sharing. But the way the world is going, you will have to think of cross country um, sharing. We are seeing this in the case of vaccine right now, but this is going to go across the board in domains where we will have to think of cross-country sharing. We just don't have the institutions right now for that. And once again, I think for major global democracies, this is a time where we will have to think of global institutions for this kind of sharing. Uh, any uh, other thoughts on this? If I can just respond quickly, Kashik, I, I agree with what he's saying. So uh, what I was 
objecting to this notion of, you know, disappropriate and transfer. Yeah, you're fired from your job, but here's a check. I don't think people like that so much. The notion of common ownership and a sense of there's a foundational thing that we all share, I, th I think that's, that's terrific. So thank you all very much, by the way. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, any, any other thoughts before we, uh, we close? I, I don't think we have uh, time left for any more questions, but uh, uh, at your end, uh, any, uh, any further thoughts or, uh, or response to uh, what was said by, uh, by others? No. Okay. So thank you. I mean, this has been a, a very uh, a stimulating uh, discussion, but unfortunately we are uh, almost out of time. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, all of our panelists for their uh, really uh, in, insightful and uh, uh, provocative uh, contributions. Uh, they gave us uh, much uh, food for thought. And uh, I would also like to uh, thank those who uh, joined us uh, online and shared their uh, comments uh, and, and questions. I mean, this is, of course, uh, uh, a continuing discussion, uh, continuing research. Uh, the uh, implications of uh, uh, far reaching uh, technological uh, transformations uh, that we are witnessing uh, today uh, implications for uh, the economy, uh, society, and polity are uh, big issues of, of our time. Uh, and uh, at, at Brookings, as, as uh, John Allen said in his opening remarks, uh, an important program of uh, research and discussion on these issues uh, is the uh, Brookings uh, Global Forum for uh, 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 on, on democracy and technology. So we will be uh, posting uh, new research and uh, discussions, uh, future events uh, on these issues uh, at the uh, Brookings uh, Global Forum website. And uh, also a recording of this uh, panel discussion will be posted uh, at, at our website. Uh, so uh, again, uh, thank you to all, to our, our panelists for uh, for great contributions and discussion. And thanks uh, to all of you for, for joining us. So thank you again and uh, goodbye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.